City of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England. I would like to introduce you to Adi Danda. Hi there. Welcome to the Peaky Agileist podcast, where I get curious about all things agile. Simply put, agile is about responding to change as quickly as possible, which can be pretty useful in today's fast-paced world. In each episode, I'll be inviting authors, thought leaders and a few friends to share their stories and insights in everyday language that even I can understand. So sit back, grab a samosa or two and enjoy. Hardeep. Hey. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you, Gabby. Thank you. May the fourth be with you. Thank you so much. I feel like that now I'm talking to you. So I have a question for you, though. Okay. Are you a Star Wars fan? Uh, not really. <laughs> I think it's an insult to the universe that you were born on May the 4th and you're not a Star Wars fan. I know, but I was born in the same year as Elvis Presley died, I think. I'm not an <laughs> Elvis Presley fan either, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I just popped out at the wrong time, I think. Okay, so today is May the 4th, mm. and... It is a particularly important day for Star Wars fans, absolutely. Uh, but for me, it's a day that I came into this, this wonderful world. And I'm super excited to have lined up a very special guest today. This lady has played a pivotal role in my career over the past few years. Not only is she my former boss, she's a mother, a prolific speaker, entrepreneur, and a leader who successfully led an agile movement to change the hearts and minds of over 100,000 people in a global bank. It's the awesome Gabby Patrick. Welcome, Gabby, to the show. Hi, party. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I feel a little bit um, like some of that intro there uh, might be stretching it a bit. I, I felt like I was introducing like a WWE wrestler, at, you know, when, when they sort of introduced somebody. It kind oh, of yeah. felt a little bit like that. I had to really build it up, I felt. I, I, I kind of think um, we need a, can you do some sort of like audio over where you get like a bell, like a ring bell that goes ding, ding, ding. There we go. Yeah, I, I think you need like a WWE name, though. Uh, do you have one ready made? I was thinking about your link to Texas. Okay. It should have something around Texas in there. Can I be the Texas tornado? No, that's destructive. I don't want to be that. Um, oh, man, this is a this is a hard one. I can't stop thinking of like hot pink lycra. Wow. Hey, maybe we can add that to the comments and ask people to to yeah. suggest a, a, a name for you, a WWE name. I think that would be quite good fun. Yeah, cool. Okay. I would love to know. <laughs> Let's do that. So it feels like an absolute age since we last caught up. Um, so much has changed in just five months. And I just want to know, how have you been coping with lockdown? Oh, do you know what? Um, what a... What a crazy topic. What a crazy time to live in. I remember um, this is going back, you know, when I was a, a young child and I was studying history at school and we were studying how every generation had a thing. Like there was, you know, either a great war that was lived through the Great Depression or, you know, in from my co uh, country in the United States, um, Pearl Harbor or 9-11. There's all these kinds of things that mark a generation. And but when I was uh, young, I remember asking my mom you know, I wonder what are going to be the things that when I'm a grown up that uh, mark my generation as something that I lived through as a grown up and, you know, how I'll deal with that. And it was a, you know, a question I asked as a child in the middle of a history lesson. Um, and I was sort of like maybe two weeks into our um, lockdown here in London. And it was um, just when before like the supermarkets had, you know, normalized their uh, their food um, uh, delivery chain. And so we were kind of like going to the supermarket bare shelves. And all of a sudden that conversation with my mom just like came back in a flash. And I was like, holy crap, this is it. This is the generational thing that I'm experiencing as an adult. 
um, you know, obviously I was an adult when I lived through um, 9-11, but I was, you know, in university. And so it feels different now to live through this um, with children and, you know, having, you know, basically, I don't know, experiencing it as like, I guess, a proper grown up um, and all the stress that goes with it. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is in my life, um, living at cause. And that's just this concept about how, you know, basically the only thing that I can control is how I respond to things um, and the lens that I choose to view the world with. So um, even in the middle of lockdown and doing homeschooling, uh, running my own business and starting that up and building content, um, for it, uh, I'm choosing to uh, stay at cause and choose the lens that we're applying, that I'm applying to it. And, you know, specifically in my family, one of the things that we have is that we apply this lens of adventure. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a huge challenge. Um, but rather than kind of uh, focus on um, being at effect, which is sort of like we're not in control of anything, everything's happening to us you know, focusing on the things that we can, which is, hey, we're going to have a great adventure. Um, I'm building a dollhouse out of cardboard with my daughter. Um, You know, I I mean, I could just go on and on and on. My back garden, I'm basically growing every veg that this country will and won't grow for me. Um, (laughs) I'm having, I I, I know, I, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but I'm actually having a great time. My family's having a great time. Oh, that's awesome. And um, I wouldn't expect anything less because um, I I think that's something that's always struck me about you is is the positivity. Every situation, you always find something positive out of it. It's really, um, I think one of the things um, that I really like to think about and focus on is that like being at cause isn't about having a disconnected view of reality. So, you know, the death toll, what are we sitting at? 26,000 in the UK at the minute. Um, It's grim. Um, But, you know, I have a friend who lives down the street and her husband is uh, an ICU doctor at one of the major hospitals in London who have a shed load of COVID patients. And, you know, he's looking at um, people who are on ventilators and are not going to make it. I mean, he's right in the thick of it. Um, And so uh, what me and uh, my daughter Eden did is... um, we, for my birthday last year, I went to um, my business partner and co-founder, Carrie Nichols, took me on a course to learn to make bagels, like New York style bagels. I love baking. And it was such a good time. So anyway, you know, my, my friend, he's got this husband who's working on this ward and you know, it's pretty, pretty sad, pretty depressing. But the lens that we choose to apply to it is that my daughter and I, Eden, you know, dusted off this bagel recipe that I learned for my birthday last year. And we turned our kitchen into a production line and made, I don't know, like 30, 30 bagels and then decorated boxes to send into the hospital. And the staff were so lovely. They sent a photograph back to us of the ICU doctors and nurses, you know, saying thank you. And that we really, it, we, it was for the night shift, actually. So, you know, it's pretty grim being on the night shift in an ICU ward that's looking after COVID patients. So, you know, it's being at cause doesn't mean that you kind of have this uh, ascent above the clouds where you think, oh, everything's okay. I'm disconnected. I'm emotionally disconnected. Um, no, it's, it's being right in the thick of the reality of the grim struggle that we're in and going, right, this is an adventure. What is, what are the positive things that we can proactively do, um, to bring a bit of a levity, light and joy in the midst of real suffering? Oh, that's such a nice touch. No, thank you, Gabby. That, that that's great. So having spent almost three years talking to you almost on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> Haven't you had enough, Pardeep? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not. Um, so so I, I, I felt that I, I knew you, but at the same time, I feel like there's so much I don't know about you. Um, so I was going to kick off with a bit of an icebreaker. Okay. Are you up for a challenge? Yeah. I don't have six toes or anything, though. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of fun questions um, okay. just to get a few more insights about your world. Okay. So some of these are, are typical Gabby style. So do you untie your shoes, that have laces, or slip them on and off? Oh, I kick, I like, <laughs> all my shoes, all my trainers are knackered because I use one, my toe to step on the heel of the other. And then I use my half taken off shoe to step on the heel of the shoe that's still on. <laughs> and so my shoes are com- constantly chewed up because I can't be bothered to bend down and untie them. <laughs> <laughs> A great role model you are for your daughter there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In every way imaginable party. 
<laughs> okay, so if you could decide what we say when someone sneezes, what would it be? Hayuga! <laughs> that sounds like Street Fighter 2. I know, Fighter. thank you, thank you, thank you. Well done for spotting the reference. <laughs> That's exactly what you it was. You've got a streak in you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> the grossest food you've ever eaten. Oh, geez, Louise. I've eaten some nasty food, man. Um, yeah, the reason I just d- did travels when I was younger and I was really adventurous um, eating stuff. Uh, you can have more than one. Can I? Go on. We'll give you two. Okay. So I think some of the grossest food um, I ever ate was I was in Mozambique. And I made friends with this lady who lived in this village. And when I say village, it's like mud huts and thatched roofs. And I went, she invited me around for dinner. And so dinner was a, t- uh, and I, I hesitate to say this because they, they gave to me from their, what was abundance to them. Um, but it was not something that my Western palate was used to, but it was cold pilchards. P- p- what do you call them? Pilchards? Pilchards. Cold pilchards in tomato sauce. I only know onion bhajis and samosas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this is like <laughs> fish with the bone still in, in a tomato sauce. And um, this, uh, like this, like corn paste, which is really good. But I, it was the thing that was a bit difficult for me was um, the cold fish with the bones and the tomato sauce. It had a really fermented, just imagine like fermented fish and you're kind of nearly there. Okay. Would you do it again? Oh, a hundred percent. It was the most wonderful experience of my life sitting with that lovely woman on a uh, grass mat on the ground at dusk in uh, South Af- you know, Southern Africa in Mozambique. It was great. Awesome. Okay. If you were to get a tattoo, what would it mm-hmm. say or visually represent? Um, I would have a Phoenix. So the reason I'd have a Phoenix is, um, because I think, uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, I get, people get the impression that I'm a really, um, positive person and I am. Um, but I think the kind of like positivity, again, it's a choice for me and, uh, I don't come from, a background story from my childhood or my early years in life of it all being, you know, roses and daisies. It's, you know, actually quite a challenging sort of, I mean, I know that lots of people have challenging circumstances, but the point is that with those things, we can choose um, what we do, whether or not we think of ourselves as a victim and think of ourselves at effect, or if we look at what it means to be a cause and we take responsibility for the choices that we now have um, and and can make for ourselves. And um, for me, the, the symbol of um, the phoenix is this idea of like going through the fire and resurrecting and, and new life. And it's also a symbol that's really um, meaningful to me because I'm a Christian and Christian, um, the Christian view of um, from, you know, death comes life is a really important and impactful one. So the symbol of Phoenix would hit like kind of multiple things. It would feel like it's my own story. I love this idea of like rebirth and resurrection and, um, yeah, beauty from ashes. Oh, that's interesting. So you got me thinking there. So if you were to come back as someone or something else, what would that be? Oh, does it have to, can it be like an animal? Does it have to be a human? Yeah. No, absolutely. It could be anything. Oh, I'd be a freaking unicorn, man. <laughs> I'd be a unicorn that flies oh, and awesome. f- shoots sprinkles out of my horn. <laughs> <laughs> and I will have to sweep over the whole world and I would, the dust, the feather dust from my, the sparkly dust from my wings and my horn would cure all diseases. And <laughs> and no, it would be like um, in Star Trek, the next generation where they've eliminated all need for currency or all diseases and all that kind of stuff. Here's a cool one. Would you rather be really hairy or bald? Oh, bald. <laughs> okay. Uh, like low maintenance. I'm feeling that at the moment. My hair's just gone out of control. Uh, yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, I bald, head to toe bald. That's cool. I do that. But I just think us Indian people got a raw deal. We're just like really hairy. And I think God did us a big injustice 
Yeah. How, how did that happen? Even from like an evolutionary standpoint, it's quite hot in India. So like extra hair probably isn't doing you any favors. I know there's like body hair is just ridiculous. But I can imagine like if it were a super cl- cold cl- climate being that hairy would be useful because it would hold in your body heat better, right? Yeah. Although I, I think ha- being hairy um, is supposed to be quite good in hot climates. Is it? It cools you down. Apparently it, it does something with the sweat. Oh, right. Don't okay. quote me on that. I, I did see a documentary once. Oh, right. Well, then I then obviously evolution wins the day. Thank you for that. I <laughs> think I know you a little bit better than I did about 10 minutes ago. I'm not sure that that's a good thing. <laughs> you might have wished you hadn't asked me those questions. <laughs> but I'm going to go out and get a phoenix tattoo as soon as this lockdown is over. I tell you what. Uh, let's move on quickly. So you talked a little bit about your background and your childhood there. Yeah. And, and I believe you grew up in Texas. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, in Texas, in Garland, Texas specifically. And I grew up, I mean, now it's all um, sort of urban sprawl has uh, sort of encompassed where I where I grew up. And so it's more like, you know, a sprawling city. But um, where I grew up, we grew up on the, the very edge of suburbia and um, sort of more rural countryside. And my uh, grandmother had um, a little farmhouse and her brother owned loads of acreage out behind it. And so some of the, you know, the best memories I have as a child are things like, I don't know, calves getting out of the, out of the field. And my dad, who is not a cowboy, um, desperately trying to wrangle them with a rope with my uncle, um, trying to get the calves back in the back 40 (laughs) on the other side of the barbed wire fence. So, I mean, um, you know, growing up in Texas, it's, uh, it was a really different existence from, you know, being here in the UK. A lot of being outdoors, a lot of playing with my brother, a lot of, um, yeah, tromping around outside on my, my grandmother's farm. And, um, one of the, you know, the great things from both of my parents that I think have shaped me, um, you know, as an adult are number one, um, my mom is incredibly creative. There's just nothing that she can't do when it comes to being, you know, creative or imaginative, um, whether or not that's sewing, knitting, painting. I mean, just totally, totally creative. And um, from a young age, um, she had us painting and drawing and, and, you know, playing music and singing and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and then from my dad's side, my dad is a, uh, is a major sort of engineering mind. And so he was constantly tinkering and building. Um, and he's kind of given me that, uh, it's, you know, specifically the sense of adventure. I remember my dad saying, I don't know, when something disappointed him, he would say, he'd say, oh, this is going to be a great adventure. Think of the stories we'll tell. Let's not be disappointed. Let's not be, um, you know, I don't know. Let's not feel regret. Let's, let's, th- let's change our perspective. And this is going to be a great adventure. Um, so, yeah. And then also, the, as I got older, all of the typical Texas trappings, the Friday night football games, the homecoming, I was a band nerd. I played the flute and band and I had a, I was in the color guard, which means I waved around a flag and, at halftime on the football field. Um, so yeah, typical, typical Texas, really. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Did, did I tell you about my story of when I visited Texas about a year and a half ago? Did you get detained? Um, no, they were actually really nice to me. Um, but the, the thing was, I, so I was at this conference I was going to present at, and um, a few of my friends, when I told them I'm going to San Antonio, they said, hey, make sure you go to the Alamo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Like everybody's telling me about the Alamo. And um, so a friend of mine, Sam, and I were going to go together and uh, we're on the plane. And he said, hey, did you like do your research? Like where's some cool places to go? I said, the Alamo is supposed to be awesome. And he said, OK, great. And then um, I remember we even we landed in Austin, which was a mistake. I should have landed in San Antonio. But um, anyway, the, the, I got the flights wrong. How the hell did you get from Austin to San Antonio? We, we got a, a cab. So we had this really cool taxi driver. How long was it? It was about three hours, I think. It was an Uber. <laughs> oh, my word. I can't believe you drove from Austin to San Antonio. It was the worst planned journey ever. I think from Birmingham, we flew to Paris. And then from Paris, we had to go to the other Paris airport. So we had to actually get a, a cab to go to the other Paris airport for the connecting flight. And then we landed in um, another American city. And then we got to Austin. And then we had to go by cab to San Antonio. Who planned this journey? Uh, it was me. 
it was it was my proudest um, trip, I don't think, that I've ever planned. But anyway, we were in the cab and we had this great Chinese driver. And even he was saying, hey, guys, make sure you go to the Alamo. Oh boy. And it was about midnight at this time. And we were, we were approaching San Antonio. And I said, hey, do, do you think the Alamo will be open now? And he looked at us like weird. He was like, are you serious? He said, no. I said, well, like, what kind of club is this? <laughs> I thought it was like oh, a cool God place to hang out and it was like a, a nightclub, but um, apparently not. No, no. It's cool by Texas standards. It's um, it's the happening place for Texas history. Remember the Alamo, you know. Did you go in the end? We did, but it was late at night, so we just took a selfie outside just to prove we'd been to the Alamo. <laughs> so I've got a selfie somewhere. Well, I mean, the Alamo is pro- like um, one of the kind of, it's part of proper Americana history kind of stuff. So, yeah, there'll be lots of cultural references to it and art and literature and stuff, as well as it being a, a historical event. So now I know. Can you tell us about your career and what have been some of your highlights to date? Oh, uh, my career and what have, okay, so can I start at the present day and work backwards? Absolutely. Is that allowed? We, there's no rules, Gabby. We just go with the flow. So whatever whatever you want. Well, I mean, I was going to do it anyway, even if you said not to, but just <laughs> so you know. So uh, I think the, uh, so what I'm doing now um, has proved to be, um, a, you know, already it's a great highlight. And I think it's because it's just um, causing me to bring to bear all the experiences I've had over the last 20 years, you know, working. Um, I have started a company called Kapaga with my two co-founders, Paul Cartwright and Carrie Nichols. Um, And we are all about um, what we call the inside edge, the outside edge and leading edge. And so the inside edge is really that personal development. So all that stuff that I was talking to you about being at cause um, earlier, um, it's about having uh, the edge that you need in order to get where you want to go as a person. And so whether or not that's being able to have flexibility in your lens and ha- living at cause, um, you know, it's all about that internally what's going on for you um, so that you can make sure that you've got that inside edge that you need. Uh, and then the outside edge is how you start to influence then the, the world around you. So, how, you know, what do you then put into practice so that you're a great team player, so that you're able to, um, you know, influence uh, the, the people that, that work around you. Um, and then the last uh, being, or, you know, work or, or, or live around you. And then the last being the leading edge. So now that you've got the inside edge, the outside edge going, um, the, the leading edge is really all about um, you taking people along that journey with you. Um, Our our, uh, leading edge stuff really leans heavily on a lot of the work of David Marquet, um, as well as stuff that you would find in Accelerate. So transformational leadership, um, Brené Brown stuff. um, It's really just a a lovely grab bag of stuff. And I think one of the great things about this this company that um, I've started with, uh, Carrie and Paul, is that we all have really different backgrounds from very different disciplines and part I think part of the I think of the genius and the thing that I really love to do is to put together ingredients if you will that other people don't necessarily see how they go together but the sum total of that is something really transformational and powerful that 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 can help people Um, and so uh, that really translates into each of those things inside edge the leading edge and and um, the outside edge and Gabby is this specifically aimed at leaders or is it for anybody to kind of pick up and build up this capability yeah i mean it's for anybody to pick up and gain this capability and it's interesting because i think of um being a leader as not necessarily being something that is attributed to a corporate title or i mean obviously we have people who are in positions of leadership but we all have the opportunity to show personal leadership in the way that we you know, manage ourselves and the way that we um, that lead others around us. So we see leadership as, yes, you have leadership roles where you have a responsibility to take people along um, the journey. I mean, similar to what I had when I was working um, at our previous place of employment where we were together. Um, but also, I mean, each of us has uh, the opportunity for um, to benefit from these principles of leadership. Awesome. And so you were working backwards through your career. What's the highlight before that? Yeah. Okay. So before I launched Kapaga earlier this year, um, you know, I worked as a uh, head of ways of working um, at a large investment bank. And 
I think the highlight of that was just being able to be in a position. I love being thrown into the the deep end and just having these sink or swim things. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, that's my style party. If I do that, did that to you loads while we were working together, ring you, you know, 10 minutes before a meeting and say, Hey, you want to go, we're, we're going to go talk to the, you know, the board, or we're going to go talk to, I don't know, the executive leadership of this, this whole division. You, you're going to be ready. And you're like, what are we supposed to talk about? Well, I don't know. We'll just get there and figure it out. So I love being <laughs> thrown to the deep end. And I think that that gave me, um, when I was there, that I think the highlight was just, I was able to learn at an unprecedented for me pace because it was just constantly in pressured new situations, constantly having to creatively, you know, construct how we were going to pro- solve problems. That was, a, that was a massive highlight. And, and I think um, I, I can't ever imagine again in my life being able to construct such an all-star team. I mean, we had you, we had Sam, we had a whole shed load of coaches from Tom Roden to Carrie Nichols and Colin and Marco and Portia Tongue. I mean, just on and on and on of really um, wonderful top talent people. Um, and Anna Urbaniak that we, that we brought together. Um, you know, we had Perry in the States as well, and it was just wonderful. So the highlight definitely was being able to work with that team. Um, I think, you know, you know, dotting on previous to that, some any highlight that I would mention as I'm si- sitting here thinking it all relates to being able to learn, being in a position where I'm constantly assimilating um, new information, new ways of doing things, new ways of seeing things. And then not only just following, you know, whatever that new thing is to the letter, but thinking about creative ways to apply it from a personal standpoint probably one of the main highlights of my career has been when I came back from maternity leave after having had my son, who's now two years old. And I have basically up until that point spent my whole career, you know, well, I've been worked in a male dominated industry. I was always the odd gal out. I mean, even before I worked in technology and financial services, I have a theology degree and there are even less women (laughs) who have theology degrees than there are women who work in technology, I think. So it's it, that sort of dynamic wasn't a new thing for me, but <clears throat> I'd always kind of hoped and looked for a woman to model myself after. Cause I had this really distinct idea in my head of what that looked like. It was this woman who prioritized her family, um, was committed to her husband and to her children and to herself as a woman knew what it meant for her to be a woman, but also, um, was really, uh, effective and, um, ambitious and committed to her job as well. And all those things balanced together magically. And it was just, you know, I had this, this, this vision <clears throat> and I'd always kind of looked for this woman and I never really found her. <clears throat> and then when I came back from maternity leave, I had this really weird moment where I realized it was me. Like I had this view and I was looking for this woman, but this woman was me. And then I just had this huge relief, sense of relief that I didn't have to go looking for her. I just had to be, I just had to be, you know, um, and, uh, that that would be all right. I didn't need an external invitation or justification or validation to be this thing that I had a vision for this person, this woman I had a vision for in my mind. I could just embrace, um, em- embrace this woman. And then this woman was me. It was a really strange kind of, um, I don't know, Phoenix moment for me. And, um, I remember telling my, uh, boss, Paul Shepard at the time, and he was so supportive. Uh, and he was like, all right, let's do it. H- how do I help you be this woman who you see and who you are? And I was like, I don't know. I just realized I need to stop looking for her because she's right here. But I don't know what this actually means. And then he was really supportive over the next coming weeks and months. And I, I you know, it's not that um, I'm not sure I fully know now even who that woman is and, and I evolve every day and, you know, whatever. But the point is, is that I stopped looking for this external person to copy um, and stopped waiting for a, an external model to validate what I wanted um, to have happen. You've really played down your role at the big global bank because I know that was a time where we were going through some really tough decisions within the organization. There was a big focus on cost cutting, projects were failing, just just as a lot of big corporates, I think, at the time. And you were thrown into the deep end on this one. You you were literally given a small amount of budget, limited resources, and told, we've got to go agile as an organization. Mm. And 
off you go. I mean, how how did you deal with that? That that's a huge ask, and and especially as you mentioned, as a maybe as a female leader in this organization that is very male dominated. I think you know from a leadership perspective, how how did you go about that? Well, I just I mean, step number one, it's it had to be bigger than me. It just wasn't good enough. I, I just I I realized that it couldn't be down to me. If it were down to me, if I was going to use this as a platform for self exaltation, I was just not only not you know, from the start gates, not living out my own personal values or demonstrating what agile is or means, <clears throat> but I just was going to, it was going to fail because it just doesn't, you know, transformation just doesn't look like that. So step number one was to hire you, I do believe. <laughs> I actually remember you saying to me, if you're still in this job in, I think it's two to three years, then we failed. Yeah. That's how far ahead you'd actually thought about it, that we shouldn't be a dependency for the organization. Well, I knew that it was going to be about creating a movement and with movements, you really don't need loads of people um, in order to create that kind of infectious enthusiasm for something. You just need the right kind of people. You need the right kind of influencers and people with the right sort of energy. I mean, and, and we did, that did sort of bite us in the butt sometimes because I, I ended up picking people that were like, you know, super influencers, high energy, um, really personable, you know, able to get out there without a, um, you know, making anyone feel threatened, get out there and sort of evangelize about these concepts. <clears throat> but um, those types of people, you know, we were pretty low on organization skills. So we might have uh, big events and really affect people, but we probably forgot to write it in the report that we were supposed to send every week for whatever reason. And so, um, you know, I, we, I just, I focused on the things that I knew was going to, um, have the biggest bang, ba biggest bang for the buck. And that was really for me about the individual, the types of people I needed entrepreneurial visionary. I needed to be able to align people, um, uh, you know, to a vision and then give you guys the autonomy to just go mental and do whatever I could to keep expanding horizons and pushing you harder and further. I mean, I remember you, I, I asked you to create a strategy for the learning um, stuff and you came back and you were like, okay, this is how we're going to train a hundred people in a year or whatever. I can't remember what it was. And I was like, pretty, I don't think you understand. <laughs> I need you to be thinking about how 100,000 people or over a hundred thousand people at the time <clears throat> um, are going to have engagement and be on the learning journey. So if you're a part of the 100,000, we consider you on the learning journey just at what point. So what does that strategy look like? And you're like, okay, I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> I almost cried. I was like, oh, my God, I've never done this before. And 100,000 people, it was just it just blew my mind. Uh, like I've, I've been used to defining requirement specifications, not learning strategies. <laughs> this is the thing, Party, is that you had been in a role previously where you were – just told to write down other people's ideas. You know, it wasn't even that you were writing down the requirements of the ideas that you were generating through user engagement or whatever. You just were completely removed. You were the do the doer. You weren't doing any thinking. You were not allowed to do thinking. You were only allowed to do doing. And I knew all I needed to do with you is to put you in a position where you were able to do the thinking and the doing and that you would just go mental and it would be a beautiful thing. And so I didn't really do anything for you other than give you the right kind of environment and the right nudge in the right direction so that you could be the best version of yourself. I mean, what a waste of a mind and of time and talent to put you in a position where all you ever do day in, day out is just do without thinking about the creativity and the people engagement and, you know, all the rest of it. So, Oh, I'm going to cry now. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have a little bit more fun now, and okay. I was going to give you another challenge. So this is a slot I was going to introduce to the podcast, which is um, the sprint of your life. So oh boy. just as in Scrum, we have a sprint where we've got to maximize value during a time box window. Uh, we're going to give you one minute. And Oh, no, my armpits are sweating now. Oh, boy. Oh. Okay, go. So Tell me. Too much information. Okay, so we're going to give you one minute, and what I'd like you to do, is give us your top tips. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be leadership, agile. It could be how to make a bagel. I don't know. But the more tips you give, the more points you score. So I'm going to give you a point for every good tip that you give. And then we're going to have a leaderboard. And every time I get a guest on, we're going to run this challenge. And then we'll see who ends up on the top of the leaderboard. Isn't Okay, fine. 
at what constitutes is a tip? Is there like a number of words? Like, could I just give you like, could I just start naming words and then, and then call them a tip? And then if you don't get it, well, then you just don't get it. I, I think a tip should be something that I can take away and act upon. So if you just okay. say socks, then that wouldn't really help me. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Mm-hmm. Steady. Go. View life as an adventure. Uh, learn something new every day. Try, try, try. Just try. Um, do something uh, that scares you. Um, create moments. Uh, create moments through memories rather than material stuff. Um, live at cause. Um, smile. Um, uh, surround yourself with people who make you a better version of yourself. Um, always never be the smartest person in the room. If you are the smartest per- person in the room, you need to find a different room, that whole thing. Um, uh, the smartest people in the world aren't necessarily the ones who have the most influence. So if you're pretty stupid, don't worry about it. So am I. And so are lots of people. <laughs> okay, time's up. No! Time's up. Okay. Right, let me total up the points here. I'm going to give you a 1,000 per point. So I counted about 11 tips there. So 11,000 points. And I'll give you 2,000 points for extra effort. Thank you. What about for the sweaty armpits? The sweaty armpits? Oh. I, I need a sweaty armpit handicap. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give you another 1,000. Okay, you got 14,000 points. That's pretty good. Awesome. You'll be pleased to know you're on top of the leaderboard. <laughs> first and only. Do you know, th- 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 this is totally unfair because I'm the first person. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't able to create a list. By the like 10th person that you get, they know it's coming. So all they have to do is like make a whole load of, load of like a list of shit that they just like. So it's going to be down to whoever can speak the fastest. And I would definitely win that if I was able to get a running start. Oh, you're saying we need to change the rules now. I'm saying that I deserve an extra million points for the handicap of being the first person and not knowing it was coming. I gave you like another thousand for sweaty armpits. I mean, no one else is going to get that. Well, I I would like some more points for being at my the dis, you putting me at a disadvantage. All right, how many points? I told you one million. One million. <laughs> Typical American, think big. Um, let's go for, let's give you another thousand. 50, 50K. 50,000. Yes. I'll give you another, I'll give you another 2,000. There we go. Because there's negotiation going on. Six, call it done. You're negotiating with a Punjabi. <laughs> <laughs> you should know. If you know Kerry, she will tell you I negotiate hard. Okay. So six? 6,000? Six, six additional six? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go on then. I'll give you up to 20,000 then. Okay. Man, I was a right walk over there. Okay. Mm 20,000. Top of the leaderboard. Fantastic. Well done. Excellent. Oh, one of my favorite questions. You're the queen of metaphors. Oh yeah. (laughs) So I was going to throw out a few agile concepts Mm-hmm. And I was hoping you could give us some of your famous metaphors to explain those to a layperson like me. All right, okay. Yeah, this isn't time box or anything like that. So, being agile over doing agile. Look, um, you can do agile. Um, you can go, but but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are being agile. You can do stand ups, um, fifteen minutes every day, go through all these motions, but that's not necessarily doesn't mean that you are agile or that you're being agile and you won't necessarily see um, the benefits or the results of having done that Uh, and the best way that I can explain that to you is you know you can go and you can sit in a garage right over an oil stain on the ground and you can go vroom 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 beep 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 but that doesn't make you any more uh, any more a car just because you're sitting in a garage uh, for all the world sounding like a car it doesn't make you a car Um, so when you think about the difference between doing and being agile, it's worth, um, looking a little bit, uh, beneath the bonnet as it were, and understanding what it means, um, to be agile so that your doing comes from your being rather than your being coming from your doing. Super duper. Thank you. Quick feedback loops. 
Is there a metaphor for quick feedback loops? Oh, yeah. I mean, like um, any anything, like a quick feedback loop is like driving in a car and looking at your speedometer. I mean, you're taking the action of pressing down on the pedal and you get immediate data back to say how fast it is that you're going. And, you know, trying to run a product without a, a fast feedback loop is like trying to drive down the motorway um, without a any kind of you know, information letting you know how fast you're going. You've just got no, no, no objective external point of reference to know whether or not you're going too fast or too slow. Thank you. See, I'm learning something about you already. So you have a fascination for violence and cars. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> we knew all that positivity was hiding something. It's got to be eclipsing something, right? Just shoving it way deep down. Flow and value. Flow and value. So you got, um, if you, if you haven't seen this, maybe you can put a link, um, in the comments. Um, Lucille, I, I love Lucy. Do you know what I love Lucy is? Nope. But I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> yep. I love Lucy is like a 1950s sitcom, really famous again, a, a, as ingrained in American psyche, um, as the Alamo. It's a really famous 1950s uh, sitcom. And, uh, Lucille Ball is the main protagonist, and um, she's just a bit of a, a goofball. Every episode, she just gets herself in a spot of bother and um, ends up causing a right mess, and it's hilarious. She's a, a, a really classic slapstick comedian, and I, I love slapstick comedy. Um, and there's this wonderful episode where she goes to work on a chocolate factory, and um, this really authoritarian line manager, like the the, you know, on the floor comes in and says, you've got to take these chocolates, you've got to put it in this wrapper, and you've got to put them back on the conveyor belt. And then they go through that door on the other end of the room. And then in that room, they box up the chocolates and ship them to the customers. Don't let a single chocolate go past the, you know, the conveyor belt without being wrapped up individually. And they're like, okay. And so this conveyor belt starts going and um, they uh, lose track. They're not, they, it, you know, the first chocolate that doesn't get into a wrapper own, almost makes it out the door and she grabs it and stuffs it down the front of her top. And then before you know it, she's stuffing chocolate everywhere, down the front of her top, in her hat, in her mouth, everywhere, and only wrapping maybe like every 10th one. And the manager comes in and can't see any chocolates that aren't wrapped and assumes that the flow is correct. So the manager sh shouts, speed her up. And so they, uh, they're like, oh, no. So then the, when the manager leaves, the conveyor belt goes like three times faster. And there's just like unwrapped chocolates, you know, everywhere. Um, and so, you know, the point is, is that um, on the other side of the line, um, even though this conveyor belt uh, was going faster and faster, like, a tenth of the chocolates actually made it into the chocolate box to, to get to the customer. Whereas if they just had slowed the conveyor belt down at the end of it, they would have got more value out of it because they would have, you know, each individual um, chocolate wrapped. I absolutely lo love that clip because um, it shows you uh, a lot of things in that one thing. It t t talks to you a lot about value, flow, quality, and a lot about management, a lot about management styles, um, uh, about kind of how when people are under pressure, they can eclipse and hide the data, which can lead the leader to the wrong conclusion because they didn't have psychological safety or anything to be able to give information back or challenge the manager to say, hey, this conveyor belt needs to go slower. But um, see if we can put that link um, in, in the comments. But the value and quality, um, everything you need to know about that, watch a Lucille Ball um, shtick on uh, wrapping up chocolates to go to customers. Awesome. That's cool. I'll definitely look for that and put it in. Okay, so uh, just going back to something you mentioned earlier, uh, we were talking a little bit about women in leadership. And mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of work to promote women in leadership and technology. Would you like to share just a few of um, your thoughts around what's your perspective on, on you know, the, the role of women at the moment? And should we be doing more to promote women? Is there anything specific you'd want to say on that? Gosh, that's a really, that's a really big one. I think it's a really tricky one too. I mean, the thing that the place that I would like to see us get to is I would like us to get to the point where we don't have to have um, these gender targets and the gender equality. Like we surpass 
So we're in a position now where we have to have these measures because we have to have the speedometer that says, hey, you're going too fast, you're going too slow. We need a data point to say this is this is out of kilter. But it would be great if um, it was so ingrained um, in our culture and in our society that we, you know, it's like, why would you go out of the house without a shirt on? Like, you know, this totally ingrained in the way that you go about um, doing society that you don't have to consciously uh, think of it, um, that you're not sort of dealing with conscious and subconscious um, bias, uh, you know, against women. So I'd love for us to get to that point. I think, um, you know, now, um, I guess the advice perhaps that I would give to other women um, is not to conform. Don't masculine, you know, make yourself more masculine to try and fit in. Don't become stereotypically masculine things like, I don't know, authoritarian or aggressive or <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Don't chop off your hair and wear a pantsuit unless that's exactly what you want to do. Be authentically who you are and don't conform um, to try to, you know, win in a, a man's world as it were. Um, I think, you know, the sad reality of it is that like, if you look at the data, um, we are so heavily biased towards middle-class white men. I mean, if you look at how products are created, the size of an iPhone is, uh, iPhone 8 is based on the average size of a white male, um, their hand. So what they can um, hold in one hand and still type with their thumb, it doesn't work for me because I've got a smaller hand because I'm a woman. Um, you know, PPE kit is um, designed for the face structure of a white male. So they don't particularly, they don't fit black and Asian men as well. Um, you know, flat jackets for women. Um, there are more stab um, uh, stab incidents with female police officers who are wearing um, flat jackets because they're designed for a man's chest. So rather than, you know, allowing for breasts. I mean, th- this stuff is peppered through culture, right? So then you get to the, um, and some of it with like serious, like life or death co- um, implications. I think when we get to this space of working in technology, the thing that I bring to the table is one, I'm not going to change myself. And two, I'm going to, you know, use the resource I have of adventure, of creativity and fun to go about it. I mean, I remember um, being brought into like the CIOs of this, you know, the bank that we were at and um, they wanted to talk about going agile and um, you know, this is a thing where I had to plan months in ahead to get like a 15 minute slot. This is very serious people wearing very serious suits who take themselves very seriously, you know, and so you've got 15 minutes to make your point and get out. And, um, you know, I'm aware this conscious and unconscious bias going on in the room. I, and the, again, the only, I think it was the only w- woman in the room apart from a, a secretary who was taking notes or a PA who was taking notes. And I showed him a cartoon. I showed him a, um, uh, the first thing I showed him was like a 60, 90 second clip of a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is a really complex um, system that does something really simple like crack an egg. So you have like a marble that rolls down a skid that, you know, lights a match that burns all the way through that knocks down a bunch of dom- dominoes. And at the end of the day, all it does is like, I don't know, ring an alarm bell or crack an egg and fry it or whatever. And I said, I made them all watch this cartoon, which I guarantee you, I was the first person in the history of that bank to um, bring a cartoon as my uh, exhibit A. But I had them watch this cartoon and they all started laughing, you know, and because it's funny, this this little this uh, it was like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. And I said, this is this is your this is your digital production line now. This is how you guys go about creating digital products. There's a much easier way to do that. It's called Agile. And this is what it looks like. Um, and so I, I never, you know, as a woman, I think it's really particularly important to not go too far in letting the um, world I'm working in um, change at a core level who I am and what I'm about. Uh, you know, those things of adventure and fun, um, you know, obviously, as in all life, that has to be calibrated for the particular circumstance so that, that there's um, that I'm still creating rapport with my audience. Um but yeah, I'd like to see us get beyond the point where we have no subconscious bias, where we see that um, in terms of this, the way iPhone products are designed. Um, and then, you know, also, if you're a woman finding yourself working in a predominantly male environment, that you just think really carefully about where the boundary lines are and be exactly who you want to be. 
um, don't conform um, to make yourself like the others. Oh, fantastic. That really resonates with me, perhaps even when I joined the team. A lot of my cultural side, I'd suppressed for many, many years because I felt it wasn't the right thing to do. And I, and I think the environment that I grew up in as well, like my mum used to tell me stories about how way back in the day when, when she had come to the UK, the neighbours would complain if they could smell curry, for example. Really? Holy cow. Absolutely. So she would close all the windows. And it was, it was almost this negative aspect of my life. And, and there were times when I'd really be conscious about not being over Punjabi. Having experienced the time that I did in our team, you really brought that out of me, even in terms of don't be the same as everyone else. Whatever you are, like flaunt it. And um, mm. and look what you created, a, a crazy Punjabi monster. Um, and then you had me at conferences, um, getting everybody up doing Bangra dancing and crazy things. It's wonderful. Well done, you. Well done, you. That's so beautiful. I'm so happy for you. Well done, you. Aww. I mean, I just think, I mean, hopefully you feel like a more congruous person. The inside matches the outside. Um, and when you get that going, there's kind of no stopping you. I think in my head, I'm like Michael Jackson on the dance floor. But yeah. really, I'm... I mean, I'm the congruity between the inside of your head and the inside of our heads might be a bit out of line. But if you feel like Michael Jackson and, you know, that's matching the outside, then as long as you're congruous. Yeah, I just don't take my kids to those sort of events. Anyway, yeah. um, moving on quickly before I get into trouble. So we're almost at the end. If you could maybe share your future plans with the new business, it sounds really exciting. I know we didn't yeah. get to talk so much about it, but like, tell us more very quickly. What, what's happening? Um, what can we expect? Who should take notice? Yeah, well, um, we are um, in a matter of weeks now launching um, our first online course called the, um, yeah, it's ex super exciting. Um, it's called the Inside Edge Accelerator. So uh, this whole thing about from your standpoint, uh, being able to look at things as being a cause rather than the effect, you know, being as the driver of your own bus, as it were. Um, it's a, a course that has six topics in it. Um, so, you know, we're going to be launching that in a couple of weeks. We're super excited about it. We've got um, a giveaway that we're doing later today, actually. So um, we're giving away one free um, uh, space to go on this course um, as a part of the, the first group to go through it. Um, and in order to uh, be able to win that opportunity, um, where you have to go on and, and, and put a comment on our Facebook group. So there's a Facebook group called the Collective Aid Edge, and I'm sure we can link that later uh, in the comment section somewhere. Yep. Um, and so we're running a sweepstakes to win a free a free seat on our course. And I'm just really excited about it because I think, you know, with all of the sources agree, um, we are not going back to how things were. We're going to have to be creating a new normal in terms of how we work, what social distancing looks like until there's a vaccine. Um, and this is all about going to be about our own personal ability to be flexible within these, these constraints that we have. Can we maintain a positive outlook? Can we think creatively about other ways that we can, you know, um, go about doing work? And, um, you know, basically this is all about that personal development that you need to, to sharpen your inside edge. Um, so yeah, that's being launched in a couple of weeks. We're super excited about that. And then um, we also have loads of other coaching and um, sort of larger scale um, coaching that we're doing for organizations around that leadership space that we were talking about earlier. But I think the next big ticket thing that's coming up is this course that we're launching called Inside Edge Accelerator. Um, and it is for anyone who wants to sharpen their inside edge and to make sure that they've got just that edge to get them, get them ahead. I mean, you know, you can look, uh, we've got uh, examples of people who, you know, they look across um, their their peer set and they think that they were up for that promotion, but they got passed up and they're not sure why. Or, you know, people who feel basically impatient to get to their best self. They know that they could be better and they're just impatient about going through that process. And you know, they want it to have, you know, have it now. So, that, so this is an accelerator uh, for that, for that purpose. So whether or not you're looking to accelerate your, um, your inside edge or you're looking for, you know, something to, to, to solve a specific challenge, this would be the course for you. Oh, fantastic. No, that sounds really, really exciting. I'm so pleased for you. Thank you so, so much, Gabby. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we go? 
I just wanted to say I am just so stinking proud of you, and I hope that doesn't sound patronizing. I just really feel like when we met, you know, for the first time, whatever it was, four years ago, I just had this vision of this amazing person that you were, and I could not wait to try my very hardest to create um, a situation where you could have this, like, um, acceleration path towards where you are now. I mean, and you know what, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing this is what this Inside Edge Accelerated course is all about, is I would just like to be able to provide that same opportunity that you had um, for anybody else who, who would like to take it on board. So I'm really proud of you. Oh, thank you so much, Gabby. Um, you don't know what, how much that means. And um, yeah, I'm getting all, all emotional. So I'm going to wrap it up there. But <laughs> thank you so much. And um, good luck with the new venture. Yeah, thanks very much. 